Gentlemen, welcome to the FCC. Hope you're enjoying your lunch. Uh, my name is Tara Joseph. I'm with the Board of Governors and a convener of the Professional Committee and a Reuters journalist. Um, before we get going with our event today, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. If you wouldn't mind, please can you turn your phones to silent or buzz so they don't go off uh, in the middle of our event and Q&A session today. And also, just to update you on a few upcoming events, we're in the middle of a busy season for lunches and other events here at the club. Tomorrow, we have a lunch with Chris Emmett, who has written a book, An Insider's View on the Hong Kong Police and Politics. That was written up in the SCMP last week as well. Also, next week, we have Erin Ramborg speaking about the Bling Dynasty, why the reign of Chinese luxury shoppers have only just begun. And then next Friday, uh, we have Benny Tai coming to speak of Occupy Central. The theme for that talk, take a guess, <laughs> will Hong Kong ever have genuine democracy? Um, so along with that, we also have a breakfast on Friday if you want to watch the results come in from Scotland. I think that starts at 7 a.m. downstairs in the bar. But now, more importantly, on to the event of today, the English radical who stirred Asia, or should we call it bowering on bowering. <laughs> I did ask Philip uh, what motivated him to write this book, whether it was the fact that it was a distant relative. And actually, he said it came bit by bit. As we all know, Philip has a very um, long and solid history of reporting around Asia and about Asia, but he kept hearing the name Bowering in his studies and decided to follow it further uh, in the book that is hot off the press. Um, Many of you here know Philip. He is a well-known journalist uh, in the region, also has been a club member since, I think, 1975, and twice president of the FCC. So it's a real honor and pleasure to introduce him. We'll make sure we leave some time for signing books at the end of the event. They are on sale here. And without further ado, Philip Bowery. Uh, thank you very much, Tara. Thank you all for coming. And I'll thank you even more if I can get through this very quickly so you can then spend your time buying books. Uh, you may wonder uh, why I should have bothered to write this book, because clearly uh, there isn't much money to be made out of uh, writing this sort of book unless you're being paid by a university or an institution of one sort or another. Uh, so I suppose I have to answer this question, which is uh, actually a little bit difficult, uh, except that it's, uh, uh, it's a process which has taken more than, well, nearly 50 years in a sense, because um, I never even knew that uh, I had this uh, distant relative uh, called Bowering um, until, well, I suppose I was in my mid-twenties, and uh, it was after I'd been at uh, university where he'd been asked by my history tutor whether I was related to uh, John Bowring, the Benthamite philosopher. And I said no, um, because I didn't know. Um, then uh, I, I did learn a little bit about him as a result, and uh, his uh, radical opinions and his uh, uh, curious mix of Unitarianism and utilitarianism. Um, but again, it wasn't until I came to Hong Kong that I realized that he'd that done other things as well, that he was, had been the governor here. And then I went to Thailand and discovered that he'd uh, negotiated a treaty which was uh, actually very well known in Thailand and uh, a key event in Southeast Asian uh, history, the Bowering Treaty with, uh, with King Mongkut. And I also discovered that somebody had written a book called uh, King Mongkut and Sir John Bowering. Uh, written by a Thai historian, published in Thailand, probably uh, printed about 200 copies at, at the most, um, but a fascinating uh, description, uh, backed up by all kinds of uh, uh, contemporary uh, documents and letters, uh, exchanges between uh, Mongkut and uh, Bowring, who subsequently became Siam's ambassador uh, 
uh, to the courts of Europe. Um, so there was a bit of a sort of a transition there. Then not very long after I was in Thailand, I, I'd been in, in Vietnam. I was just coming back from Saigon, I say, in, in 19, April 75, and I happened to be sitting uh, on the airport bus and got chatting to a, the girl sitting next door, who turned out to be uh, from Indonesia, and she was a Christian from Indonesia. And when I gave her my card, she said, oh, are you any relative of uh, the Bowering who wrote hymns? So I said, well, no, not as far as I know. <laughs> uh, but I said, well, I better investigate, you know. And there I learned that uh, he'd written all these hymns, uh, one of which is, uh, several of which I, think I gather are still sung today and, uh, and, and also quoted today. Um, in fact, one of them was quoted by, um, not by, uh, no, I can't remember, sorry. Um, yeah, George Bernard Shaw. Yes, one was quoted by George Bernard Shaw. It is now attributed to George Bernard Shaw in many uh, collections of George Bernard Shaw's uh, um, works. But anyway, it's uh, Bowering's original um, hymn. Um, but then I, I looked up. Uh, what else, uh, what else did Mighty have done? And, and in the, you know, this was before Google. It was a dictionary of national biography. And, and there his main claim to fame turned out to be as a polyglot. He spoke, you know, a, you know, a dozen languages and could understand, you know, a dozen more, ranging from uh, Hungarian through Russian to Swedish to French, German, Dutch, Italian, Portuguese, you name it, uh, he knew it. Uh, and there were even uh, little poems written about his uh, uh, ability with, with language. Um, so this was uh, clearly you know, a man of, of many parts. Um, and the more I look, the more references there were to him in all kinds of different places. Um, but they were all scattered in obscure works uh, on Unitarianism, or on Bentham, or on uh, the iron industry in South Wales, or uh, uh, the Arrow War with China, or the, you know, the treaty with Siam, or uh, uh, you name it, uh, he was scattered all over the world, but he didn't seem to be coming together in any one place. Uh, so when I began to think, well, maybe this guy deserves a biography. Why isn't there one written already? And I, uh, I was puzzled about that, and, and actually remained so until um, one of the people who reviewed my book before it was published, a, a writer called John Kay, who's written extensively on India and China and, and so on, he said, oh, it's perfectly... The reason is that biographers hate polymaths. He did too many different things. Uh, people like you know, the people who write biographies like he did, just did one thing, like Raffles. Raffles only did one thing in his whole life, but it, 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 you can focus on it. Bowering did so many different things, you can't possibly focus on it. And therefore, uh, however interesting it may be in some ways, uh, it's not going to make a book that a publisher will necessarily want or that readers will want to read because it's uh, it's, uh, it's scattered all over. He's uh, spread his talents uh, too thin. Um, but I thought, well, yeah, that's, that, that's true. Uh, on the other hand, there's a way of looking at uh, his experiences um, and saying, right, these are so diverse uh, and they cover at least half of the world at a time when Britain was at the height of its uh, global power. I mean, his, um, his career lasted between the siege of San Sebastian, when the uh, French were driven out of Spain, uh, to the, uh, the Franco-Prussian War, which you know, really describes the whole period uh, of British dominance before the, uh, you know, after the collapse of France and the rise of Germany and then of the United States. So uh, he was absolutely in the middle of all this. He was the uh, creation, in a sense, of a an era of a revolutionary era, because he grew up, grew up just after the 
uh, American Revolution, just after the uh, French Revolution, um, just after the Industrial Revolution. And so all these things were, were part of, uh, of the revolutionary era from which he came and of which he became an important uh, person in promoting uh, ideas of uh, secular, secularism, of um, free trade, of uh, representative government, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so anyway, so we, you know, you, if one puts all these things together, and his family history was also quite interesting because of his, uh, he had many children, and most of whom did some quite interesting things, um, including one who became a nun, and the first uh, headmistress of the Kanoshin College here in Hong Kong. Um, but anyway, um, so I decided, well, maybe I can write this book, and I, but I wasn't convinced that I could do it until I read this uh, article in an obscure Cambridge historical publication, 2008, which described him as, as being the leading figure in the globalization of world trade. And I thought, well, that's quite a stunning statement to make. And even if I don't 100% believe it, at least, you know, we have here a theme which overarches all the other things that, uh, that he did. Um, so, and it, it explains why, despite the diversity of these of activities and the, and the fact that this book does not actually contain all that much about the trade issues, because the trade issues tended to be, you know, not terribly interesting to write about, even though they were actually very important, um, became the, uh, the title of the book, uh, as well as the theme which I think entitles him to be regarded as somebody of, some more, uh, of greater importance than has uh, hitherto been acknowledged. Um, unfortunately, his, uh, uh, his achievements in, in many fields have been rather overshadowed, uh, certainly in Hong Kong, um, by the uh, war, with, uh, war with China, the Arrow War, which became, well, after his, his time, really, the uh, Second Anglo-Chinese War, sometimes inaccurately called the Second Opium War. Um, anyway, I would just sort of summarize now, I think, uh, where he came from and why he how he did what he did, and the, how he came to be such a diversified person. Uh, he came from a family of small businessmen in Exeter in, in southwest England. This was a family which had always been uh, radicals. Uh, they were Unitarians. They opposed the, uh, uh, the aristocracy. They opposed the uh, uh, established church. Unitarians were actually even technically illegal. In, in England until 1812, because they denied the existence of the Trinity. Um, so he grew up in this atmosphere of, of, of uh, small business radical types, uh, interested in education and so on. His grandfather had been a great defender of the American Revolution and had been uh, burned in effigy outside Exeter Cathedral for his pains in supporting the Americans. Uh, so there was a, a history here of, of uh, radical thinking, and uh, uh, but he went into trade, uh, left school at the age of 13, uh, but then became fascinated with learning foreign languages, which he did by chatting to the uh, traders who came to the quayside at uh, Exeter. Uh, he also studied languages, wrote uh, his diary in different languages in order to improve his linguistic skills. Um, but also then learned that Exeter was on the decline. Um, this was his first experience, really, of, of the importance of free trade. Um, Exeter re relied on the cloth industry, but the cloth industry was in decline in Exeter because it was uh, migrating uh, to Yorkshire. Uh, one reason, of course, was technological change and steam and power, uh, steam and, and uh, power and uh, water power. Uh, but another reason which he wrote about was that the 
um, restrictions and the uh, monopolies and so on which existed in the old-fashioned uh, Exeter wool trade uh, made it uneconomic and that it was uh, destined to fail, which indeed it did. Uh, so he took himself off to London and joined a firm there in the, in the uh, trading with Spain in, uh, and elsewhere in, in the wine and fish and stuff like that. Um, as a Rothwich, who sent to the um, Peninsula War during, uh, sorry, to the Peninsula during the Peninsula War, uh, to su supply uh, the British troops with uh, wheat and so on and so forth, and to, to buy supplies from, from the locals. Uh, as a result of which, he um, became fascinated with Spain, and then after the war, he was at the siege of San Sebastian, and then set up his own business in Spain and in France, uh, trading various bits and pieces, um, and became fascinated with Spanish literature. Um, taught himself you know, all kinds of Spanish dialects, uh, translated uh, um, Spanish poetry, wrote articles about Spanish poetry for magazines in, in England, uh, and became involved in all kinds of radical circles. Uh, Spain, in 1812, had a constitution, a very liberal constitution, which um, became a, a highlight of uh, reform movements in, uh, throughout Europe at that time, and uh, continued through the period of uh, reaction in Europe, which followed the Napoleonic Wars, um, with, with the restoration of, of the church and restoration of monarchs and so on and so forth. So he became very much involved in all these radical movements, uh, as well as in uh, literary activities. Uh, expanded these to Russia, learned Russian, um, learned Dutch. Well, I think he knew Dutch already. Um, then started a literary career by uh, organizing the first translation of Russian poetry into English. Specimens of the Russian Poets, it was called. Um, and this sort of began to set him up in, in the literary circles. He uh, became a, he was introduced to Jeremy Bentham, and this is where the uh, Bentham uh, becomes so important to his whole career, um, because Bentham had no time for poetry, had no time for Unitarianism, on the other hand, uh, Bowering agreed, you know, had all these ideas about free trade, and together they wrote a, 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 a pamphlet, which was a, you know, forerunner of really most free trade uh, documents, um, urging the abolition of all kinds of restrictions and monopolies. Uh, so that established him in in in, in new circles of, of uh, quite important circles. Of you know, he became. Bentham's closest associate and uh, translated a lot of Bentham's uh, writings into uh, other languages and corresponded all over Europe with these people. Uh, then he got involved in the, the Greek War of Independence, um, the secretary of the London Greek Committee, um, which was headed by Lord Byron. Lord Byron, of course, went to Greece to help the, uh, uh, the revolution. Uh, unfortunately, he died. Um, and uh, Byron's body was consigned to Bowering in, in a cask of rum. So, so, so Bowering took possession of Byron in a cask of rum. Not quite sure what happened to him. He eventually ended up being buried somewhere, I think, in Leicestershire. But uh, um, anyway, the, the Greek thing led to uh, all kinds of scandals because there had been a loan involved and... and the, the, and this resulted in uh, becoming rather unpopular in certain quarters. Uh, and then his business went bust because he'd uh, spent too much time on uh, with the Greeks and, uh, and other issues. Um, so he was really out of a job. He had five children by then, uh, no way of support, except for Bentham. And Bentham then appointed him uh, editor of the Westminster Review. A, a journal uh, created by Bentham, which was his main uh, uh, voice, uh, certainly the voice of a group known as the Philosophical Radicals, who uh, 
uh, was stirring up English politics in the period of, uh, before the reform movements of, uh, of 1832. Uh, so, um, there he is. He's, uh, he's got this minor job as a, a literary figure, editing Westminster Review, and still write, you know, doing translations of poetry. Um, but he needed you know, something more substantial. So he reinvented himself as an expert on public accounts. So next we find him uh, in France uh, um, discussing French public accounts and in Holland discussing Dutch public accounts and writing uh, reports to Parliament uh, on uh, the need to reform public accounts, which led to uh, a parliamentary committee for the reform of public accounts of which he was the secretary and which led to a complete revolution in the English public accounting system. Uh, uh, meanwhile, at the same time, he, because of this, uh, because he's sort of now engaged and in, in, in uh, official circles, he was recognized as a, as a player, albeit a very radical one who was the uh, loathed by various people, including the Duke of Wellington, who tried to stop him being on the, the committee for the uh, public accounts, um, and also pursuing all kinds of other radical ideas, particularly including uh, uh, Catholic emancipation and reform of, of, of uh, government in Ireland and so on and so forth. So, uh, there he was, a, ra a very radical figure, but also sufficiently kind of up to speed with uh, economics and uh, other things that uh, he, in the promoting reform of accounts, and then taken on to promote free trade around Europe, which he could do because he was uh, uh, such a good linguist. He went to France on several occasions uh, in company with ministers of one kind or another, and just went around giving speeches and writing letters and, and uh, being interviewed by journalists and so on everywhere, promoting uh, ideas of free trade. I say mainly in France, but in Italy, uh, you went also to uh, <laughs> you went to Italy, where he described meeting the Pope. That uh, poor Pope has a poor understanding of trade. <laughs> uh, so that led to. Uh, him getting involved in, uh, he, he went to um, uh, Prussia, uh, to Berlin uh, in uh, 1830. Oh, no, first of all, he went to Ottoman Empire. He went to the, to Egypt to the Khedive. Spent nearly a year in, in Egypt uh, negotiating with the Khedive, writing a long book about uh, e the state of Egypt and you know British policy and. Uh, towards the Ottoman Empire and, uh, and so on and so forth. Went up the Nile around Syria, uh, so wrote a 500-page book on the subject. Um, but then back in England, went to Prussia, was uh, there to try and promote um, the idea of free trade against the idea of uh, the Prussian concepts, which were being promoted by a guy called Friedrich List. Uh, Friedrich List is uh, hardly known in English-speaking circles, but is actually an extraordinarily important economist who uh, um, has inspired various people, particularly in Korea, uh, because he wrote uh, the book about, called the, um, the National Economy, and it, it's really about the use of protectionism uh, against uh, to build up your industries, and that's what Prussia was all about, and. Uh, and Bowering was trying to argue against this. Uh, at the same time, he was involved in arguing with Marx, because Marx thought that his liberal ideas were leading, A, to uh, the oppression of the working class in England, and also to imperialism abroad. So there's uh, a lot of, uh, you know, he was directly involved in these major in intellectual as well as practical disputes uh, at that time. As a result of which, actually, he then decided to go back into Parliament, which he'd been where he'd been briefly in the, in the 1830s, and became member of Parliament for Bolton, uh, which was a sort of pit of, uh, of poverty, but also a place of progress in in the industrial Britain. Uh, supported the Chartists in their revolutionary campaign, um, and in Parliament uh, did various things such as. Uh, promoting uh, 
um, end of flogging in the army, demanded the end of capital punishment, very early on to demand the end of capital punishment. Uh, a lot of other reform measures uh, active in the anti-slavery movement and the um, early movements for, in favor of women's participation in politics. Uh, but at the same time, he became an entrepreneur uh, with an ironworks in South Wales, um, which developed very rapidly and was praised for the very progressive uh, policies towards its workers. Um, unfortunately, with the slump of 1848, uh, with overinvestment in ironworks, uh, which was a result of the railway boom, and the railway boom had a had a bust temporarily at least, and uh, uh, he lost all his money. The work survived, but he went bust. And so he needed a job, which was how he came to be appointed by Palmerston, with whom he had long had uh, quite good relations, although they were not on the same side politically, um, who gave him a job in Canton as consul and uh, plenipotentiary, of, uh, sorry, of superintendent of China trade. Um, I won't go into the details of his activities in, in, in China, um, because a lot of you may be fairly familiar with them already, but he certainly had a very uh, positive effect on some aspects. Uh, particularly, for example, the, um, the creation of the uh, Chinese Imperial Customs Service um, set up when he was uh, in charge um, and uh, encouraging uh, people to learn, you know, administrators to learn Chinese, and, and which he himself did at a very late age when he was in Canton, he uh, became quite fluent in, in Chinese. Um, I went, as far as uh, Hong Kong is concerned, his career was not particularly successful. Uh, he had many good ideas, um, most of which were not implemented until after his time uh, because of opposition from uh, European merchant community, from London, um, uh, from all kinds of people except the uh, local Chinese who actually regarded him very highly. Um, and when he left, in uh, 1859, um, he, he left with their thanks and left with the disdain of the Europeans. Uh, um, there's a lot of history attached to that that we've no time to go into, uh, no time to go into the uh, Arrow War or the causes and, and effects of that. Uh, but I would just end by mentioning uh, you know, a couple of things. First, not that I've already talked about Thailand, its treaty with Siam. Uh, he wrote a book about the Philippines. It's a very interesting book about the Philippines in, in 18, uh, uh, 1858, um, which is still quite valid today in, 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 in many ways. Um, he continued after he left in, uh, Hong Kong to be involved in uh, free trade issues in, in, in Europe and other radical uh, questions. And, you know, altogether, um, he, one can sum him up, I think, simply uh, somebody who had, through his whole life, uh, pushed for things which, in the end, almost largely happened. Uh, freer trade, representative government, Secularism rather than, than, than uh, church or uh, so on run uh, groups. Um, these things were his lasting legacy, as well as an internationalism which didn't come easily to, to, to the English. Um, and I think if you read what, what, say, King Monkut had to say about him, about his, uh, his liberal attitudes in, in almost everything, uh, if you read what he has to say about uh, Confucius. He wrote a 5,000-word essay about Confucius, uh, and he was also deeply involved with the Bengali reform movement for reform Hindus. Um, the promotion of the idea of, of ethics rather than religion, although he was a sort of religious person himself, he, he, believed, he was a theist, really, and he believed that ethics and theism was really the only way to go and that one had to get rid of um, religions focused on rituals and idols. So, um, I think 
I'll give you 10 minutes to uh, ask some questions, and then you, then you can buy some books. I hope uh, this has been, I, I'm sorry, this has been mainly about his career other than in, in uh, Hong Kong and China, but I've been very deliberate about that because uh, those were only 10 years out of uh, a career of 60 years. So uh, think of him for all the things he did in the uh, other uh, 50 years. So thank you. Philip, thank you very much. Um, we have microphones, so if you'd like to raise your hand, uh, we'll come around if you have a question. Please give us your name and uh, association if you're happy to do so. Uh, uh, Philip, I had the privilege to read the book. I enjoyed it very much. I hope you'll write many more books. Uh, I hope a review of it will run in the Asia Week Chinese edition this week. Uh, please could you address one issue, which is that um, as you mentioned, in Hong Kong, he was very uh, well liked by Chinese. Could you say that he regarded Chinese, Russians, Egyptians, all these different people he met in the same way? Did he look at everyone equally? Which was mo would have been most unusual at that time. Thank you. He hasn't quite... His views, I think, on... He talked a lot about race, but he, race really in a sort of a social development context rather than in a, um, uh, a genetic or ethnic context. Um, that's, I mean, he was, um, he loved Spain and in everything Spanish, but he was very um, dismissive of the state of Spain at the time. He was very dismissive of China at the time, but very admiring of the China that he, you know, saw as having been. The China which he, you know, he saw from his reading of Confucius and, and so on. Um, as far as race is concerned, I mean, he, he wrote uh, one of his, back in the 30s, 1830s, he wrote uh, um, uh, an essay which appeared in one of his minor works called uh, M uh, Minor Morals for Young People about the equality of skin. And it's all about the equality of black skin compared with white skin. So, um, yes, he wrote a lot about you know different levels of civilization places, but I don't think he, he believed in that there were permanent differences. There were merely differences of level at certain uh, points and I think he, he had a in the context he, he wrote something about Singapore in his uh, book on the Philippines, uh, which sort of goes into that by talking about the the the, the, the different levels of, of uh, social strata as perceived by you know in Singapore at the time. So you had uh, you had whites and then you had straight Chinese and then you had other Chinese and then you had uh, uh, North Indians, and then you had Tamils. Uh, I mean, this 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 was a, actually just a reflection of the reality of uh, of the time. Whether you could say that was racist, probably in today's context, people would say yes, it is. But uh, in the context of the time, I would say it certainly wasn't. Philip, I'm wondering if I can barge in briefly. Sorry, I'm just curious about the Unitarian background. Um, for many people with religions, they, they left uh, seeds of that or missions, etc. I wonder if he did anything in terms of bringing Unitarianism over to other countries, um, maybe in a way the Unitarianism drove his more liberal beliefs? Well, I think Unitarianism, I mean, in, which was in a sense as close as you could get to secularism, you know, but still be a believer in, in God. Um, this was, you know, very much with him throughout his life. Um, and in fact, his second wife sort of revived that. And, and his second wife went on to become a leading uh, woman suffrage advocate. But uh, uh, that's another story. But um, uh, I think, you know, Unitarianism 
was a, a force which he saw as uniting people. He could see that, I mean, uh, one of his associates at the time was um, Ram Mohan Roy, who was a Bengali reformer. Now, uh, Roy regarded himself as a sort of a Hindu Unitarian. Uh, he was a Hindu theist. Uh, he, I, he wanted to, you know, make Hinduism an ethical religion rather than one focused on uh, rituals and gods and, and, and so on. And I think that, you know, that's a theme which runs throughout his, his writing. Uh, in fact, if you read his essay on Ram Mohan Roy, um, then you, that comes through very strongly, that this is a principle which you can apply uh, you know, in Christianity, in Judaism, in Hinduism, and, and so on and so forth. You need to get rid of the idols and, the, uh, and, and concentrate on the ethics. Over here. Simon Twiston Davis. Um, Philip, in the, in the spirit of a, a magazine story, was he fun? Was he interesting? Did he have many wives, many children? Lovers? Did he? Was he entertaining? Did he live the life of? of, of he obviously went around the world having a, a, a great deal of experiences. Did it make him a joyful person, or was he a man who just wrote tracts and very kind? <laughs> no, I mean he he was he was very busy. Um, he had <laughs> he had. Uh, he had seven children. Uh, his first wife died, partly the result of poisoning in Hong Kong. Uh, he then quite quickly married again, this uh, much younger woman. Um, he's regarded as, as actually very charming and easy to get on with, very sort of liberal in his ways. Um, and in fact, that was one of his problems in, when he was governor of Hong Kong. He simply wasn't tough enough with some of the, you know, sleazy people he had to deal with. Uh, he, that he got where he got from very, you know, what was a very low status uh, compared with all the other people around him in literature, in diplomacy, and most of the people in politics um, at the time were higher born people, people with, with you know, landed estates or at least with money income. So he, he had, you know, he had to survive on his own. Uh, now, it helped that he had all this, this Unitarian connection because the Unitarians were a, a significant, uh, not very big group, but a, certainly a significant one in, in, involved in, in trade, in business, in, in uh, uh, development of new academic institutions, for example, uh, uh, University College London, where Bentham's body, of course, is uh, still uh, uh, in situ, uh, stuffed um, as a result of the, of the auto-icon essay. Anyway, you can read all about the auto-icon essay in the book, but... Uh, um, yeah, I mean, he, he was very pushy, um, he couldn't have got where he did otherwise, particularly in his, in his younger days. Um, there's a quite amusing anecdotes of, of uh, how he would sort of sidle up to, um, I think it was a, uh, some aristocrat in, in, in France and uh, um, uh, ask a rather inappropriate questions about her children and, and so on. Uh, uh, but he was sort of liked for his... Uh, not bad manners, but for his uh, lack of uh, gentility, I suppose. I think we have time for one more question. Thank you, uh, David Lawrence, associate member. Thank you very much for that talk. It's achieved its purpose. I'm going to buy your book. Um, but to one point, really, you mentioned that he was a great support of democracy. A mischievous question. What did he do for democracy in Hong Kong? Uh, he, he, he proposed that Chinese of a certain level of income should be allowed to vote 
in Legislative Council elections. <laughs> this was rejected. <laughs> Maybe that's an appropriate note to end it on. <laughs> One of the true democracy uh, advocates in Hong Kong, and that was many years ago. Philip, thank you very much. Uh, as I said earlier, books on sale, and I think you'll be here for a while to sign books. We wish everyone a happy afternoon. But before we finish, a small gift from the club. Great afternoon, everyone.